All right, we're ready. Tom, take it away. Well, hello, and welcome to Tom Talks. Uh, my name is Tom Simpson. I work with McHenry County Conservation District as the uh, research field station ecologist. Um, and I get to do a lot of fun things, including some research uh, and, uh, and education and land management. Uh, but the Tom Talks is something we really we started uh, just about a year ago, not quite a year ago now, um, uh, in response to the COVID uh, pandemic. And uh, I think we've all enjoyed it more than we ever ex ever thought we would. So we're, we're continuing on. And today's subject is uh, winter ecology. Um, I'm gonna, my, my predilection as an ecologist is um, I'm a contrary person in my, in going through school, it seemed like every ecologist was interested. I always saw the world from the animals or plants point of view outward. And I, I um, do studying a lot of geology and soils. I tended to look at, look at the ecosystem from the physical environment inward. And so you'll see that kind of a little bit in the presentation today. So we'll pay a lot of attention to microclimate and heat exchange and a lot of things like that. We'll also look at animals and how they, animals and plants and how they physiologically prepare themselves and survive through the winter period, which is a time of great difficulties, a time of food shortages and uh, end up, and we'll talk a lot about water today, water, this essential fluid of life freezes solid. So we have a lot of stuff to talk about today. And we'll, we'll sort of uh, graze over a lot of subjects. Welcome to Glacial Park on a beautiful winter day. Let's go so enjoy some time in the snow. Well, hi, Flashy. How are you doing today? What are you wearing? Well, you told me to dress in layers. I didn't tell you to wear the whole closet. Oh, well, um, yeah. I, wait, my nose itches. I can't, I can't reach my nose. Forget it. Okay. Just go ahead. It's seasonal change we're talking about okay, this time. Okay. Welcome to Glacial Park today. Uh, if we're going to study winter ecology, uh, we really need to start with studying the seasonal changes uh, that happen every year so we don't get caught by a sudden winter storm. Uh, my nose still itches. Uh, can, can That's what trees are for. Don't look at me. Uh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Feels better. Thank you. So, um, I mean, most of you know this story, so I won't dwell on it for any length of time. But um, you know, the the uh, seasonality of, of our climates in the, in the in the northern hemisphere is really controlled by really two things: the 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 Earth's orbit around the sun, um, its elliptical shape, and by the tilt of the Earth's axis. And it turns out that the, the that between those two, it's the tilt of the Earth's axis that has the stronger influence. So uh, in our summertime, uh, you'll see the Northern hemisphere is tilted at 23 and a half degrees toward the sun. And so we're getting the sun more directly overhead, more solar insulation, more heat entering the environment. And so the climate warms up in the winter, just the opposite, the Northern hemisphere is tilted away from the sun. And so the sun is lower in the sky. You'll notice that the winter sky of the sun uh, skirts across the, the horizon on the, in, in, the, in the, the southern sky. And it was never really very, very uh, directly overhead. So the amount of solar radiation entering is, uh, is less and, uh, and it cools off. One of the things that when I looked at this, there are two things that bugged me about this diagram. One of them is the relative size of the earth and the sun. It shows the sun sort of as a golf ball with this giant earth rotating around it. This is approximate approximate magnitude of sizes between the two. Only the Earth is about 100 solar diameters away. And so the Earth, a tiny little Earth, would be way off the screen and somewhere in my neighbor's house. Um, and uh, and the orb, this shows the sun in the middle of the orbit. And in fact, it's not. The sun is at one of the two foci of the ellipse. This is a fairly long ellipse, much a much longer ellipse than, than the Earth. Uh, moves around the sun, but the, earth, the sun would be sitting at one of these two foci, not, not at the center. Uh, those little things bug me. Uh, so let's talk just a little bit about winter weather. Most of our snow, most of it comes from uh, low pressures that are moving across 
uh, North America, and you see this characteristic rotation of a low pressure. It's counterclockwise, and I I love to put in explanations of things, and I put in a long explanation of the Coriolis force and why why low pressure zones rotate counterclockwise and high pressure is clockwise. But I could see Jackie had a sour expression on her face when I was going through that, and it was a little a little bit too much. So I uh, I took that out, and but here you can see this counterclockwise rotation. And so as that approaches the, these prevailing winds, the jet stream is moving these, these uh, cells from west to east. As this approaches the Chicago area, you'll see that this south wind is pulling moisture up from the south, relatively warm moist air up from the south, moving that northward colder. And so that's where the precipitation comes from. And on the backside, it's rotating around and bringing relatively cold, dry air in. So that's how you often get with those big snowstorms and it gets cold and clear the day afterward. That's just typical low pressure moving through the Midwest snow in that first half and then cold, clear, the temperature uh, dropping in that second half. Really just a characteristic of these uh, weather systems as they move across the continent. And then a low pressure, the air is, air is converging uh, and, and, and uh, going upward in the center of the low pressure. And as air goes upward, it cools, called the adiabatic loss rate. And as it cools, the air condenses. And so that warm, moist air is condensing your clouds. So it's rain in the summertime and snow in the winter. Whereas a high pressure zone, the air is moving away from that center. And so in the center of, of the, it's called the anticyclone, the cyclone is counterclockwise, the anticyclone is clockwise. The air is moving downward and as it moves downward, it's heating and drying. And so the high pressure on the backside of, of those fronts as you move through tends to be clear and sunny and, and cold. Um, So we're gonna, now we're going to take a, a, a finer scale look at, at local temperature variations in the landscape. I was looking at the weather report. It said it's supposed to be 25 degrees, but that doesn't seem right. Wish I could be paid to be wrong half the time. Well, Jackie, often the weatherman is both high and low on the same day because it turns out every way you look in the winter landscape, the temperature is different. Uh, be at the bottom of the snowpack right here next to the ground or on top of the snowpack here. It could be a different temperature on this side of the tree than on this side or at the bottom of the valley in the very top of the hill. Uh, and while the differences may be very small, these small differences can be very, very important to the survival of plants and animals in winter. Now let's take a closer look. <laughs> I can't believe I ham it up that much, but there you go. Um, so let's look a little bit at cold air drainage. I said the differences can be very small. In fact, they aren't always that small. I forgot on the day we did our videos, I was going to bring a, uh, an infrared uh, thermometer where you can take the temperature of surfaces in just a few seconds. And on a really sunny winter day, you can get 20 and 30 degree differences between the bark on the sunny side of a large tree and on the on the shady side. And while that, that doesn't mean the tree itself, the core of the tree uh, is quite that amount of contrast. If you're, a, if you're an insect in diapause living in the cracks and crevices of that bark, those temperature changes can be quite significant. So uh, let's, let's look at a landscape here, sort of a valley with a elevations increasing on both sides. Now at night, uh, at night, heat is radiating from the earth. You don't see it, but the earth is cooling off and it's cooling off really from the, there's always heat radiating from the earth upward, but during the day, the sun is, is, is pumping more energy into the system than is, you might say, leaking out and upward. Uh, but at night, the opposite is true. There's no solar energy entering the system, but the earth is radiating heat upward. And so the ground gets colder and colder and colder overnight, really until the early morning. And so uh, by during the night as that earth is, is chilling well below air temperature above, 
it chills the surface layer of air and that surface layer of air is then more dense. It's dense and cold and it starts sliding down slope. You, you can actually feel this sometimes if you're really still uh, uh, just sitting out in the woods. I remember in Alabama one time being out in the woods sitting there along a slope in the evening and you could hear as, as the sun went down and things started to cool off, you could sort of hear the crackling. I'm not quite sure what that was, a sort of crackling in the litter. And then you could feel that cool breeze just sliding down the slope. There was no overall wind that, that evening. So this is a real phenomena and that cold air moves down. And if this is a closed depression or even in a river valley that isn't closed, but that air will start to pool up and so you get much colder temperatures at the bottom of the valley than you have at the top. Even vegetation can block that air movement as it's sliding downward along the slope and create cold air pockets even along the slope. Uh, I, in, uh, I think it was 1986, I was a graduate student at the University of Michigan. I spent my first summer, not with my doctoral work, but helping out some other graduate students in the Jack Pine Plains of, of, uh, of central lower Michigan near the, near the thumb of Michigan. Sandy outwash plain, pitted outwash plain. So there were these, these kettle holes, deep closed depressions in a sandy outwash plain. And so uh, the cold air would sink to the bottom of those. And particularly in spring, you would get freezing temperatures near the bottom of those, uh, those kettle holes, even when it was quite warm up above. And so you'd see this frost line on, on the trees, the aspens that were growing in and around those kettles would have no leaves below a certain elevation in the kettle just because of that frost, just because of the frost pockets. So that was a striking visual. I wish I had some pictures of that. Um, hey, Tom, we had a question in the chat. Okay, Look, hold on. The digits temperature pretty, pretty cold. Go ahead. Um, how would you want to report the temperature of an area that has more hills than in Illinois, but so different? Well, you don't have to ask somebody from the weather surface, you know, the official temperature is a certain number of feet above the ground and it's, uh, it's not in the shade, it's in a special shed that protects it from the sun. So there's a lot of, I mean, that's the thing when you hear an air temperature and the air temperature, maybe on the, the day where I'm standing there, I, I think it was like single digits, but where, everywhere you look, it's different. If you've got a sufficiently accurate thermometer, everywhere is a different temperature. And so there's just a convention in, in the weather service about, about what you call the, the, the ambient air temperature. It's, uh, I'm not, and I don't remember that. I should have looked that up before the presentation today, but there's, there's a formula for that. So they're, they're, their standard weather stations stand about eye height. So I would suspect that's quite in your, your uh, sufficiently far from the nearest uh, vegetation blocks uh, or, or large buildings uh, in which you're, you're measuring these things. So that, that's, that's what that standard temperature means. Um, it's often much, much colder right at the ground surface in the morning and, and in fact, sometimes warmer when you're up in the crowns of trees. Uh, so, you know, kind of depends where you are. There's a different temperature everywhere. Does that answer the question? I think so. Thank you. Okay. So we're out in the woods today, and uh, well, it's probably single digits temperature, pretty pretty cold day. And the average person just walking around, I mean, you're just cold everywhere. You get you get that, you know, it's in the 70 degrees indoors. You put your winter coat on, come outside, your face is cold, your nose is cold, um, your finger fingers get cold uh, in a few minutes. So when you start looking around closely outdoors, which human beings don't do that often anymore, you find out that it's really not the same temperature everywhere, and particularly if you look at a whole 24 hour cycle. And that's why I have these temperature sensors here today. These are the same ones I use with my microclimate study in the phenology program. Uh, I can program the decaying temperatures once a day, once a minute, once an hour. And these are now set to take a temperature once every hour. And they will uh, do that. I'm gonna push the button here, and that, uh, that, that gets them started. Give you a flickering of the light. So this is a double styrofoam burger box here. It's not easy to get these anymore. Everything's biodegradable, but if you're gonna sit them out here for a long time, you can use biodegradable boxes. So I had to search 
to an environmental impact burger box. Uh, so I'm going to put it in there, put it on a little wooden block to keep it, it in case it does melt and we get a little water in there, the sensor isn't sitting in the water. Close the box. There are some vents in here just to allow the outside air exchange. And now I'm going to tie a little pink bow around it just to keep it closed and to make it easy to see with a white box against the white snow. perfect Christmas present or what? Uh, I'm gonna leave that right there. And, uh, so now we're gonna go out into the out in the open field and leave one to see if there's any difference in, in temperatures between this wooded side and an open field. Okay. So oh the uh so I ended up putting sensors uh, in the woods and then out in the open field and also in a, in a in Lost Valley Marsh, which is a huge depression uh, you drive through as you enter the park and you often get cold air pockets there. But uh, to, to really get a, get a maximum effect of a cold air pocket, you need a clear night. You see here, this is just a little schematic of heat radiation. And when there's no cloud cover, that heat just goes upward and escapes uh, all back into the universe. Uh, where Whereas when you have cloud cover, that heat is intercepted by the clouds and then re-radiated downward. So it never, it doesn't cool off as much overnight. I mean, you've all noticed that on the, the really cold winter days that it's really cold in the morning, the sky is completely clear because all that radiant energy just escaped and, and you get a maximum amount of cooling at the surface. And that's when you get a maximum amount of of cold air drainage is when you get that dramatic cooling of the, of the surface. And so we didn't quite get that. It was snowy, uh, cloudy and snowy for the three days that I had this, the sensors out there. So, but we did get some interesting results. The, the valley, the difference between the open site, just an open field and Lost Valley is really the difference in topography and cold air drainage. And so you see those two are plotting pretty much together, a little divergence there. I'm not quite sure what to make of that. But the, but the comparison with the woods is exactly what we would expect. The woods are absorbing uh, solar energy during the day. Uh, the, the woods, even though the leaves aren't there, the trees are providing some shade. And so it doesn't heat up as much during the day. You're seeing about a five degree difference in temperatures in the middle or in the warmest part of the day. And then at night, the trees absorb that re radiant energy all day and they're re-radiating it at night. And we'll see some more evidence of that re-radiation of heat. Uh, in fact, if, if, I, if I had brought my, uh, my uh, infrared thermometer that day, you could see that big trees are, are warmer than little trees because big trees absorb more radiant heat. And if you're out, and so they'll hold that heat uh, more. And overnight, the little trees cool off much more. So here we just see that effect of, of the, the moderation of temperature just by those big, big oak trees sitting around absorbing and re-radiating the heat. And this, this shows a little bit of the, of the cold air drainage here. This is from the phenology study and it's in March, uh, which was our earliest period of, of monitoring during the phenology study. And so we have Lost Valley Marsh over here, the yellow line. And, uh, and this is the steep south slope. This is very high elevation, steep south slope. So absorbing a lot of solar radiation. During the day, it's open. So it warms up more than any other place. But you can see here the uh, Lost Valley Marsh is the coolest in the evening. And this is putting together 30 days, really averaging you know, 30 days of mornings and 30 days of afternoons over the whole month and so you're not getting the most striking cooling effects, but uh, you do see the cooling effect of that uh, closed depression of the marsh with Lost Valley Marsh being colder during the night and into the morning than other upland sites. I want to look a little bit at the at the winter, the winter feedback loop. Uh, when you in the when we have snow on the ground you get Reflectance, it's called albedo when you're talking about the whole planet. Uh, but the, the sun is hitting that white surface and a lot of it is reflecting upward. Um, 
And so that energy isn't absorbed uh, in the snow, into, into the snowpack. Unlike when there isn't any snow that the, the, the sunlight is absorbed and re-radiated as heat is warming the earth. And so just, just as we move into that period, we've been in for quite a while now of, of, a, of a snow covered surface, it lowers the overall temperature of the area simply by that effect. And uh, you see it here, it's just a, it's a feedback loop. You're, you're decreasing heat absorption from the snow, you get colder temperatures that increases uh, the retaining that snow cover increases the albedo uh, reflectance, decreased heat absorption. So that just, that cycle keeps it cold. I mean, that's also true if we wanted to talk about ice ages, the buildup of the ice caps as they built up, they increased the Earth's albedo, it lowered the Earth's temperature, and so it further increased the sizes of the glaciers. So, and it works the opposite at the end of the ice age. So that's an important feedback effect. Um, that's possible anytime we're, we're looking at, uh, at those seasonal changes. And here's that, there's that absorption and re-radiation of heat. It's the most common of phenomena and you'll notice it more as it starts to warm up. This on the left was early in the fall or early, early in the winter where the snow cover was thin and would melt back between snows. And this is in my backyard, little oak trees I'm protecting from the rabbits. And you can see the, the, the welded wire cage absorbing and re-radiating and heat and melting the snow around it. A little bit, of, little bit of, a, of a cavity of snow around the tiny trunk, even that tiny little oak tree uh, melting some of the snow around it. And here's a larger tree when we were out, Jackie and I were out filming for the, uh, for the podcast. You can see that starting to happen, even though it was really quite cold. Oh yeah, there's there's my graphic of the heat going off off of the trunk of the tree, melting that snow. So we're going to talk a little bit about water. This is a critical part of talking about ecology in winter. Water, I mean, you said about seventy some percent of your body is water. Or there's water running out throughout, and any any living thing that's alive has to have water in it. The dry, dead vegetation around me may have some water in, it, but that's not important particularly important because the above ground part of those are probably a lot of goldenrod in there. Um, um, and much of that is, is, all of that is dead. So the, but even water in the roots is subject to freezing. So we have to think about water and how it changes state from liquid to solid here. And uh, the most important properties of water, I mean, life on earth would not be the same if water wasn't what it was. You can see here, the density of water is, is uh, changes with temperature. Uh, as with most things, when they warm up, they become less dense. And, and uh, the density is the vertical axis, they become less dense. But water is unusual and the changes to a solid state, it also becomes less dense. So its maximum or its maximum density is about four degrees Celsius, which is around uh, high 30s. Fahrenheit, that's its maximum density. And as you cool it below that, it actually gets less dense and, and then it, it freezes um, um, or it, it becomes ice and then becomes less dense as you, you cool it down. So that's, a, that's an important property of water, particularly when we look at aquatic ecosystems. Because just imagine a lake, a 50 foot deep lake. Uh, and and what now, where we now live in a world where ice is heavier than water. So in winter time, that surface of the water would crust over because the air would freeze it. But instead of the ice floating, it would sink to the bottom. And then more water would freeze and that would sink to the bottom. And then more water would freeze and that would sink to the bottom. And if that's continued throughout the winter, even relatively deep water would fill up with ice. As it is, that doesn't happen. As ice freezes, it, it, it uh, stays at the surface, eventually forms an ice covering over the surface. So. Um, allowing allowing uh, fish and other aquatic organisms to live in this cold, relatively oxygen rich water at the bottom. But let's look at this at this lake. During the summertime, it forms a fairly stable temperature profile with cool, cool maximum density water all the way at the bottom. We're talking about a really big deep lake here that stays at four degrees C 
right now it's like Lake Michigan at this very bottom would stay very close to maximum density, high 30s, um, even, even in the summertime. But the, up, the surface here is fairly warm, less dense. And so it's stable, less dense, warm water, colder, more dense water at the bottom. But in the fall, as the surface cools down, you eventually get this temperature equilibrium from top to bottom. And then this, the, wind, the ice is very susceptible, or the, excuse me, the water can turn over as wind churns the water, it can circulate. Uh, in, a, in a shallower lake where the, where the bottom temperatures are above four degrees, uh, as, that, as that cold water becomes more dense, it actually sinks down. And that turnover is incredibly important to the life of a lake because that, that brings nutrient-rich water where the plant and animal degree is accumulating in the bottom that brings those nutrients upward and that takes the oxygen rich water from the surface downward and that's critical to the life of the lake. So that's why we get that oxygen rich water, that maximum density oxygen rich water at the bottom of the lake that keeps fish alive. Um, and then again, in the spring, you get that same temperature equilibrium top to bottom and the possibility of turnover and that circulation that's critical to the life of a lake. I mean, typically in bog formation, what happens with a bog is this stratifies and there's no turnover. Uh, typically, it's, this is a relatively shallow system, you know, at least not more than a few tens of feet deep. Uh, and as soon as, as soon as it stratifies and doesn't turn over, organic matter starts to accumulate at the bottom because there's no oxygen down there and it starts to accumulate and fills in. Uh, but we'll talk about bog formation in another time talk. And this is critical to how the way lakes and water bodies work and allows really what we know of as aquatic life to exist. An important feature of water is its latent heat. And this is kind of sneaky stuff because we're used to objects that get warmer slowly as you add heat to them and get colder slowly as you, as you take heat out of them. But, but something, is, something weird happens with water is it changes state. And state, I mean, it changes from a solid to a liquid and from a liquid to a gas. So if we start on the bottom with ice here uh, at minus 20 degrees Celsius. So that's, uh, um, that's somewhere around, I think around zero degrees Fahrenheit. I'm not sure it's well below, well below freezing. That's enough. Uh, I'm still not good at, at uh, moving back and forth. But as we, as we warm that up, as we add one calorie of energy for every gram of ice, that ice increases in temperature by one degree centigrade. So it climbs very linear straight up until you get to zero. So in order to, to, to warm that one gram of ice 20 degrees, we added 20 calories of energy. But we add another calorie of energy and that ice doesn't change, it just sits there. And we add another calorie and it doesn't change. In fact, we have to add 80 calories of energy to that one gram of ice to change it from a gram of ice at zero degrees Celsius to a gram of water at zero degrees Celsius. So that's that, and that's called the latent heat, in this case of crystallization. Uh, extremely important, uh, as ice is freezing on a surface, it's actually giving up heat. So, you know, when, when you have citrus plantations in Florida, and you have a quick overnight freeze and the farmers are, are frightened of damage to the trees, they do what seems very counterintuitive and they go out and they spray water on the orange trees. And so you get these weird, you know, icicles hanging from the or orange trees over, over, over the overnight. And the reason they do that is because is that if they keep that sprinkler going, as long as that ice is freezing on the tree, the tissue of the tree can't go below zero degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So they main, they're maintaining that twig temperature in the tree at the freezing part, warm enough to keep the, the tree tissue alive um, through that cold night when the air temperatures drop well below that. And had they not put the water on the tree, the twig temperatures would have dropped well below freezing and a lot of that tissue would have died. Uh, so now we're, now we're in the liquid phase. And, uh, and as we add a gram, or as we add one calorie of heat, the water increases at one degree Celsius and it starts climbing upward all the way to the boiling point, 212 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 degrees Celsius. 
But then we add another calorie of energy uh, and we start moving along this straight line and we, we don't get any change, it's still water. And in fact, we have to, in this case, add 540 calories of energy to change that, that water at 100 degrees Celsius to water vapor at 100 degrees Celsius. That's called the latent heat of vaporization. This one is really important to life. It's important to you and I, because this is why we sweat during the summertime and why you feel cold when you step out of the shower and your bathroom isn't you know, cozy 85 degrees, you feel cold because that water instantly starts to evaporate. And as it evaporates, it's sucking 540 calories of heat energy out of your body as it evaporates, so it has a chilling effect on your skin and you instantly feel that. But that's, that works to your advantage in the summertime when you're trying to cool yourself with evaporative cooling. In fact, all mammals use evaporative cooling and, and as do birds as a way of, of, of moderating the heat increases dur during the hot summer. You only have to lose a tiny bit of water to draw a lot of energy out of, out of the body. Hey, Tom, we had a question. Okay, go ahead. Do you think future projections of climate change will have an effect on the lake temperature cycles from earlier? And what would that look like for the ecosystem? Well, I mean, the, the, the overall change in temperature, I mean, you have to get a pretty massive change in Chicago temperatures, not to, not to get temperatures near freezing during the winter time. I mean, the, the lake turnover system operates in Alabama as it does here. So that chilling of the surface, the colder air sinking and then, the, the, and then displacing nutrient rich warmer water at the bottom upward in the fall uh, is a phenomenon that would take place. So the turnover lake should continue. And that doesn't mean it would turn over in exactly the same way as that. I mean, there are many, many things that would, that, that, uh, that climate change and global warming are, are going to affect. It, it won't affect the overall turnover of the system, though it will affect a lot of things about living things that are living in water. Thank you. Okay, this is just look here. I like to run experiments myself rather than grab everything off the internet. Just practical little science experiments. This was a glass of water. I put it on the patio on a cold night. I think it was about 10 degrees. Uh, my wife works in the evening and I get bored, so I do these things. And so I, I put, the, put them out on a, on a little uh, trash can out, out behind the, uh, the back door. And so the water was about 65 degrees coming out of the tap. And then I just took the uh, infrared thermometer. I probably used a, should have used a stem thermometer then, but I just had the infrared thermometer. So I use that in a clear liquid. It doesn't work as well, but you can see the temperature is dropping pretty regularly down to that freezing point. This sort of looks like the curve we looked at before, only, only the, the graph is in the opposite direction. So here it's dropping at a regular rate as that water cools off. I mean, it's, it's dropping at one calorie per, per gram per degree Celsius. And then it stalls out and changes very slowly uh, for, for uh, quite a few minutes, um, well over an hour. The temperature is dropping just very slightly. And that's because the, in this case, I mean, you have the ice forming around it. The water was just a cell inside of that glass of water. So how could I have had a, uh, a stem thermometer with a, with a sensitive end of it right in that center, it probably would have stayed right at 32 degrees for the whole time, but it's just dropping very slightly. And then after, after about an hour and a half, after it starts freezing, then it starts to drop at a regular rate after that. So you see that, that same phenomenon we saw before. And uh, this latent heat of water is important to the moderating effect of water bodies on nearby areas. This is the, this is the lake effect you'll feel along Chicago uh, shoreline during the summer when the air is warming. When the sun is warming, you have a warm earth, cool water, air rising over the warm earth, falling over the cool water, and then the water evaporating, further cooling you have by that evaporative cooling, 540 degrees per gram, uh, cooling that air off and that moist, cool air moving inward and then cycling upward again. So that's why it's cooler along the lake shore. I mean, the opposite effect happens when the air is, when the water's relatively warm in the winter and the, and the, and the earth is relatively cold, air is sinking over the air, sliding lakeward and then cycling upward. But 
And in fact, you can get these same effects near any lake uh, during night and day. I've never, I've never done this near Lake Michigan, no near Lake Superior, where I worked uh, during the uh, 1980s as a graduate student. You could feel this as a daily cycle during the summer when we were doing our work overnight. This would be a nighttime. The earth is cooling off, the lake is relatively warm, and so the warm air is, is rising, the, the cold air from the land is sliding lakeward. And this is the in, the, in the early morning, and we were canoeing southward on this long inland lake. We always had this lake breeze in our face. By the evening, we had the opposite effect going on. We were paddling north on that inland lake. And this, because the, now the ground was relatively warm, the lake was relatively cool, you get this, the lake wind is coming off the lake. So we were literally uh, canoeing into the wind both ways. I mean, that sounds like an old saying, but in this case, if you're working along the lake, that actually happens. Uh, hey, Tom, we had another question. Okay, let me, let me go ahead. Does water's various mineral content have any effect on the calculations? Well, and anytime you add a solute to water, mineral salts of any sort, that the freezing temperature goes down. And when we talk here in a minute about how plants adapt to cold, uh, that's one of the key things. In fact, plants, animals, insects, they've all invented very similar mechanisms. It's not surprising. At a cellular, cellular level, all, all living things are very much alike and they've all, all these have invented different ways of, of lowering the temperature of that water. And, as, and well, we don't use salts so much as we use other sugars and other other compounds to lower that temperature. So so as you add salts uh, to water, it's why you salt your driveway. Uh, why uh, my days back, back in olden days when I was repairing truck tires for a living, I would add salt to these huge tractor tires that were full of water because that was, the water was for the weight to help give the traction and, and weight to the machinery. Um, and you had to put salt in the water to keep it from freezing during the winter calcium chloride in that, in that case. Uh, oh, no, we have to, I have to show this one. Just outside Lost Valley uh, Visitor Center, right now the snow seems to be about 10 inches deep. It's compacted a bit over the last week. We haven't had a lot of fresh snow, just a little bit of dusting on top. Maybe we'll get to see some animal tracks later in the day on that new snow. But I just wanted to show you temperatures relative to the snowpack, because you've got a situation here where the mean annual temperature in the Chicago area is somewhere in mid 40s. And so if you went down six, seven, eight feet in the ground, you get to a point where the temperature is pretty constant year round. And so during the winter when it's cold above and relatively warm below in the 40s, that heat is rising to the surface all the time. And when you don't have any snow, that heat dissipates from the surface so rapidly that the surface of the soil freezes in fact, the frost can go several feet deep uh, on a really cold, uh, you know, prolonged cold during the Chicago winter. So when you have a deep snowpack like that, it's like putting your coat on when you go outside and the earth being your warm body and this cold air up here. And that snowpack is a really thick layer of insulation, much thicker even than the parka I have on now. So what that does is it allows the warmth from below to rise to the surface and warm that soil more and more. Um, so I have one thermometer just lying here in the snow and that shows about six degrees Fahrenheit. So about um, 24 degrees below the freezing point. Over here I have a, a, a solar thermometer that just pushed in through the snowpack right to where it touches the soil. It's about 28 degrees, so just a little bit below the freezing point. And here is another soil thermometer that's pushed about, about two inches into the soil, and that's right at 32 degrees. So that's showing exactly what we would expect. Heat rises from below, raises that soil temperature right at that interface between snow and soil. It stays right at that freezing point, even though uh, last night it probably was down below zero here. Uh, still, that, that thick insulating layer allows the warmth to rise from below and raise that soil temperature right to the freezing point. And so we have a little graphic here that just basically shows that. I mean, any 
Uh, e even in a pretty harsh winter weather, if you get a deep snowpack, the, the soil is generally thawed below. I mean, it was easy to push that soil thermometer in um, because the soil wasn't, wasn't frozen. You see in the even, in, evening and at night, temperatures radiating from that, from that snow surface. And so the temperature of that snow in the very upper layer uh, chills down way below freezing. But uh, here, at, here at, at this point, at, at the bottom of the snowpack, you have heat coming from below, warming that surface up really right to the freezing point. Now, the reason it doesn't, why doesn't it just melt all the snow? But think about the latent heat of crystallization as, as each gram of water melts, it absorbs 80 calories of energy. And so it has a chilling effect as it starts to melt. And so that, that mitigates that melting effect right here at the surface. It's hard to change change state in water, easy to change the temperature of water or the temperature of ice, but hard to change at that, at that point where, the, where, the, where it's changing state, you have that buffering effect of latent heat. And so it stays right at that freezing mark. I mean, it's really important to animals like voles, very, very common mammal, one of the more abundant, abundant mammals in a, in a natural, in a natural landscape, and they're, and they're tunneling around under the snow, spending almost all of their life here. So it doesn't really matter as much how cold it gets up here. They're keeping their temperature right around that freezing, freezing mark. So much easier to stay warm. If you remember, if you watch the, uh, the soil, the Tom talk on soil, we talked about fins and about the upwelling of groundwater. We're in a very, very close body where I did a scene for that for that video because we're right next to Lost Valley Visitor Center it's just up the hill over here. So we're right at the base of this slope. Now here's a, the, uh, the ponds were originally dug decades ago as a water source in case the, the building up the slope would catch on fire. And while we have naturalized the shorelines and made them look like a natural feature, this would have all been fen ground 100 years ago many thousands of years. So it's an area where groundwater is upwelling. So there's a pond here and you can see right along the edge where the groundwater, which is at 40, you know, 40 some degrees is coming to the surface so quickly that it, that it melts the ice at the surface. And so you can see in a number of spots right along this edge where the groundwater coming up, melting the ice and creating open water, even though the temperature is in single digits and it was below zero last night. It's a pretty striking feature where you can really see that movement. You can really see a demonstration of that water movement that creates the fin during the summertime. Uh, and here it is creating So just a, a really neat uh, example of that warmth that's uh, that's only six or seven feet under under my feet in that in that uh, picture there, that warmth uh, influencing the temperature of the groundwater that then comes to the surface and uh, you know, has that striking effect. And it would be interesting to, I didn't do this, but interesting to go into a fen area where you have that constant upwelling and, and to look, take some deep soil temperatures and see how that differs from, from other upland sites. Maybe, maybe the next time we do this in a Tom Talk. Oh, uh, this is because I'm a, a lover of soil. This is always one of my favorite winter phenomena, uh, needle ice, uh, because most people don't look down all that much. I've done that ever since I was a kid. I was always looking down and picking things up. And uh, so the, the, the time to see needle ice is early in the winter or, or late in the fall when you get freezing, freezing temperatures overnight, nice, clear, cool night, it drops below freezing, but the soil is relatively warm and moist um, down below. And what happens is that, is that ice freezes right here at this soil surface. Uh, this, this is, I got this off the internet. I've never quite seen ice needles that I've seen them long, but not that long. This is just taken in my backyard uh, uh, at the start of winter. And those are those little ice pedestals are about an inch long here. Um, so what's happening here is the, is the water freezes right at the surface. Remember the soil is warm, relatively warm and moist below. So the ice right at the surface freezes. Uh, and so what happens when ice changes from, from, from a liquid to a solid is its free energy state drops. And, and water, I mean, this is, this is true if you're trying to, in geology, or trying to explain how flint nodules form in a, in a mass of calcareous sediment in, in Silurian deposits and 
how we get flint nodules today or, or how a crystal of uh, silica f starts to form a quartz crystal in a, in a molten volcanic or, or, or in, in magma. This is all the same. The crystal forms free energy of, of, the, of the substance drops. And so molecules of that substance migrate in the direction of a drop in free energy. And so water is migrating upward along soil pores to the surface and it pushes that little bit of ice upward. And as it pushes it upward, it freezes and, and the water keeps streaming upward from below. And you get this, this funny little, this is the soil. In this case, it was sand and here it's just the, the sort of clay loam soil uh, pushed upward sitting on top of these little ice pedestals. And when you walk on this, it has a wonderful crunchy feeling. Uh, uh, I call it wonderful because I never, I never uh, tire of that every, every time I get a chance to walk on needle ice. As, as it, in, the, in this case, as the temperature warmed up through the day, those needles collapse and you, you won't know it, but it could form again the next evening. Fascinating little phenomena. You don't have to go to Antarctica or a high alpine area or the tropics to find this. It's in your backyard. Well, let's look a little bit at ice crystal growth. There are a number of people ask about hoarfrost. And we had some pretty spectacular hoarfrost this, this winter. Uh, you know, crystals growing out an inch away from these, uh, these twigs. And, you, and, uh, and that's very typical, different, different from a typical frost where you'll just get a, a white covering over the twig or grass surfaces and sort of typical frost. And what's happening uh, in any frost, we'll, look more at hoarfrost here in a second, is that the earth, let's just do a common frost on your grass in, in your yard, overnight the earth is cooling or radiation going upward, the temperature of the earth drops below freezing mark, and when it does that it chills that surface layer of air below the freezing point, so water in that air then condenses directly, <clears throat> excuse me, directly from the gaseous state to, fraught, to, to ice crystals on, the, on that grass surface. Not spectacular, but, but that's a common site, the most common of sites. Uh, and that fall and winter, when we're waiting for that first frost, if you're a gardener, you're hoping it holds off. But let's look at, at hoarfrost. So a twig, this tiny little twig, or in this case, the dead uh, stem of a goldenrod or other, other plant, is radiating heat like any other physical object, it absorbs it during the uh, during the day, it's radiating heat and cooling down uh, all night. And as it cools down, it's chilling the layer of air around it. Uh, and eventually, uh, an ice crystal forms. I mean, I'm just symbolizing ice crystals with a six-pointed star. It's, this is not quite what ice in this case isn't forming six-pointed stars, but I only had a limited range of, of shapes to use in this graphic. Uh, and, and if, if the conditions remain stable, and so you've got a stable uh, amount of water in the atmosphere, a stable temperature, those crystals will just start to grow. And as that, as that water vapor crystallizes, uh, it only crystallizes on certain positions on the existing ice. And so the crystal continues to grow outward from, from the twig. And so that's how you get and the reason, oh, there we go. Um, so in this case, a lot of this is needles and you'll see that ice can form all these different shapes. Uh, you know, the familiar sort of snowflakes can form at a number of different temperatures. You can get plates, you can get tubes, you can get prisms uh, uh, and you can get needles. And so, so you have to maintain a fairly narrow range of conditions in the right right amount of water in the air for these crystals to grow out. But we obviously had some really spectacular, uh, con spectacularly consistent conditions for the long growth of that, of those ice needles and the creation of that hoarfrost. Hoar, I think, refers in this case, H-O-A-R, to uh, old man's beard, the sort of uh, white, white bearded, uh, which is what my beard would be if I let it grow out. Um, Hey, Tom, we had a question. Okay, hold on. Let me. All right, specifically for the ice crystals that form on the ground, 
Why do the ice crystals seem to grow upward instead of just spreading out so you can slip on it? Um, well, in a typical frost, I mean, the, the frost is covering the surfaces. So it's, uh, it's covering the, the, the grass blade surfaces that, that chill down overnight, uh, you know, in the grass, because it's a, it's a thin, it's a thin blade, it can chill down more overnight than a big solid mass can. So the, the ice, the, the grass blade will be covered with tiny little ice crystals uh, because of that. I'm not, I'm not sure I answered the question or I understood the question completely. I mean, that, and it, so that, that's a sort of typical frost. Uh, the, uh, the hoarfrost, in that case, I mean, it's, I mean, we're getting into the physics of crystal formation and you're getting to my limits as a, as a physicist, which aren't hard to get to the limits of. Uh, but as the crystal forms, I mean, the reason a crystal has a regular shape like the, the, the six-sided crystals of quartz is that that's a, it's a set lattice structure of, of, of the crystal, the, the, the atoms and, and ions that come together to form. The crystal join only at certain points and maintain the form of the crystal as it grows. And similarly with ice crystals that as the crystal forms, it, it doesn't just form as a glob that gets bigger and bigger and bigger, but, but as, as, uh, as tiny bits of water vapor crystallize and add to the crystal, it grows at a, and keeps a certain shape. So I'm, I'm not sure I really answered the question very well, but that's about the best I can do. Thank you. You can ask it again afterward if, we, if I didn't get to the, to the bottom of it. What are you doing? Pretending to be frozen stiff. And why would you do that? I want to know what it's like to be a tree with all the water and all my trunk and branches frozen solid. How long have you been doing this? One hour. How's it going? Any insights? Those are cold. I meant about the trees. Well, I guess I've learned what it means to be still. Yeah, it's hard to be still in the woods. You should try it sometime. Right. Anything else? Um, I, keep, I keep on feeling very small. Oh, whoops. Sorry. What are you oh, doing? I mean, um, in my little bit of levity there, uh, sort of overstated something. All the water doesn't necessarily freeze inside of a woody pond. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about that. Certainly when you get really severe cold, uh, water freezes and there's really no, no way animals and plants can prevent that if they're exposed to that, that extremely cold temperatures. There's a lot of ways that, that plants, and we'll learn a little bit later in the presentation, animals and Insects, fungi, all can control the way in which it freezes, and that's the important part. So, as a plant cell, uh, in the in the summertime, when it's when it's an active growth uh, situation, uh, each cell has what's called a vacuole, which is just a big sack of water, and the water is used for a lot of metab metabolic processes. So, that's a very important part of the cell. It can make up quite a bit of the of the volume of the cell. Just this big sack of water. And while that's really important during the summer when, when the plant is metabolically active, it becomes a hazard in the winter time because of that, because that big um, lump of water would turn to a giant crystal which would break the cell membrane and kill the cell. And if that happens to a lot of cells, the tissue dies and, and then the organism dies. And so plants have to, have to get ready for winter. It's called hardening off, like nurserymen and foresters talk, talk about hardening off a seedling before they're selling it. Uh, and uh, that's a process of, of dehydration. So as we reduce that cell, cell water content, the, 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 uh, the cell is moving water from inside of the cell from these large vacuoles into the cytoplasm, the sort of general soup of the cell interior, and from that into these intercellular spaces. So it's, it's reducing the size of the vacuole. Uh, it's also increasing sugar concentrations inside of the cell, both in 
So intracellular water, both in the cytoplasm and vacuum, increasing sugar concentrations is any solute. We use salt, you know, for, for melting uh, snow in our driveway, but adding sugar uh, with, does the same thing. It melts, it, it lowers the melting point of, of water or, or raises that, no, excuse me. It's, I always get, I'm a bit dyslexic, so I'll get this mixed up. But um, as, you, as you add the, uh, add the uh, solute to the water, it, it makes it harder to freeze. And so it, it uh, so you don't get the ice crystals forming inside of the cell. The opposite is true outside of the cell. The, the, the plant actually encourages ice crystal formation between the cells by creating proteins. Proteins are just a whole class, just zillions of different kinds of proteins, very large, complicated uh, molecules. And, and those are actually encouraging nucleating or, or causing ice crystals to form outside of the cells because as ice forms outside of the cells, if you remember the, the, the story of needle ice, uh, organisms have figured this out too, as the ice formed between the cells, it's in a lower energy state. And so that's drawing liquid water out of the cells, further helping the cell dehydrate itself inside. And the ice crystals are forming between the cell walls, the cellulose cell walls. And so that doesn't injure, injure the cells that would have been formed inside of the inside of the cell and broke the cell membrane. Uh, likewise, it's using another kind of protein inside of the cell to bind the water to, uh, to prevent it from, from cooling and allow the super cooling of water. And that, all that means is water that goes down in its liquid state below zero degrees Celsius. And also water when it's inside of the little tubes in the xylem or the wood tissue of a tree, the water carrying vessels the curvature of the vessels actually binds water in a way that, that lowers its freezing temperature and so makes it harder to freeze. And you can see this here in this diagram. Here are probably our oaks out here. Oaks have really large vessels for carrying water. I mean, particularly red oak, if you get a little stave of red oak, you can actually put it in a glass of water and blow bubbles, very large. That's which are re really efficient for carrying water during the summertime. The larger vessel has much less uh, resistance to water flow than small vessels. So it's a great invention uh, for carrying water, but there's a hazard to this because look, the water freezes just below zero degrees. The, the, the vessels are large enough. They're giving very little protection from ice formation and the vessels are large. So the ice crystals are very large when those ice crystals melt in the springtime, what happens is the ice expands when it melts, it contracts when it, when, it, when it thaws, and it leaves air gaps in the water column. And so an oak tree really can't use those vessels for more than one year. The air gap uh, causes cavitation in the, in this, uh, and so the, the, the plant can no longer draw water through that vessel. And so this is the story behind oak trees and why they leaf out so late in the springtime. They leaf out late because they have to grow and put on a new layer of wood before the leaves come out and demand water. So while it looks like in, in late, in late, uh, you know, late winter, early spring, when the oak tree is just sitting there and you start to see some spring ephemerals blooming and, and the oak tree still looks like it's asleep, it's not asleep at all. It's act actually at its maximum growth rate in diameter while it's just sitting there and apparently not doing anything, but it's putting on a new layer of wood in order to carry water because when the leaves come out, they will instantly demand water. And if they don't get it, they'll, they'll wilt and die. And so that's kind of the story behind oaks and their late, uh, their late leafing, leafing out. But as we go to this opposite end over here and we get into, into some of the conifers like black spruce over here that grows well up into the boreal areas uh, and even in, in the, and into the tundra where we have uh, willows. They have very, very fine vessel elements or tracheids in the case of conifers that, that lower that freezing point of water here down to minus 10 or so. And even that obviously it gets colder than that on the tundra. And so the water still freezes, but with those very fine vessel elements and, and tracheids, which have some other 
uh, morphological features that 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 help that help it when the water freezes. But with those very tiny vessel elements, the crystals are very small, and so more often than not, the water column reunites when it thaws, and so the the little willow shrub very low willow shrubs can again start moving water through those xylem vessels in the spring, the Arctic spring when, uh, when it starts to leaf out. So a number of ways that plants are both, are both moving water around, protecting the sensitive tissues, slowing the, slowing the freezing of water, making sure the ice crystals form, they're small or they're in places where they don't hurt the plant. Uh, it's a variety of ways that plants have evolved to tolerate that the hazard of, of freezing water. I didn't think I'd have to ask this twice in one webinar, but what are you wearing? I just thought I'd go out for a little run today. It's a nice day. You and I are warm-blooded animals. Which means I have to keep a constant body temperature, regardless of whether it's 25 below zero or 110 above zero, which gives us a huge advantage over cold-blooded animals. But even, even despite that, how do we stay warm in winter? That's a question we want to answer now. How do, how do warm-blooded animals in particular Keep their body. You did a pretty good job of acting like I was tired. I thought that was good. That's method acting. Uh, um, um, so I said one thing, that was a little bit of an overstatement there. I mean, warm-blooded animals, or what we call warm-blooded animals, we use some other words for that here in just a minute, both have a lot of advantages over cold-blooded animals and some real big disadvantages too. So we'll talk about both of those in the next few minutes. Uh, one of the ways that warm-blooded animals um, Survive in winter. I mean, particularly for 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 animals like like dogs and wolves and people and and cats, we have to maintain a core body temperature that's consistent, and I mean very consistent. Where if your brain temperature drops more than a few degrees, you become disoriented and sluggish in your thinking. And if that continues, hypothermia is what that condition is called. Pretty soon, you're incapacitated, and if someone doesn't get you to warm warmth pretty soon, you're going to be dead your brain can cool down into the 70 degree range sometimes and you can be brought back to life. But by that time, you're completely unconscious. Somebody else has to pull you out and warm you up. But so we have to find ways of retaining core body temperature, particularly brain temperature, but we have to operate in a cold world. And so the long skinny paws of a wolf are important. Uh, that's what allows it to move around and to catch snowshoe hares and other prey in the winter. And so it has to use its leg. If those long skinny legs lose a lot of heat to the outside world and you, you can't have really, really thick fur on the feet and legs, it would slow you down too much in pursuing animals. And so there's some limitations uh, to keeping those paws warm. And one of the ways that wolves reduce heat loss or control heat loss is with this countercurrent heat exchange so that they're routing arteries which are bringing warm blood from the heart outward and veins that are bringing that cooler blood back to the heart. They're, they're putting them right next to one another. So there's heat exchange in the limb and that controls the amount of heat loss. And so they allow, they allow the paw to chill down well below core body to body temperature because a colder paw uh, works better, or it doesn't necessarily work better, but it loses less of that precious heat. Every calorie of energy you lose to the outside world, you have to replace by eating something. And so conserving heat is a way of, of allowing yourself to live without eating as much. And that's critical in the winter for where, where food is typically in short supply. So, I mean, just to, as a Kind of a sidebar, animals use this heat exchange with a, to keep themselves warm in the summertime. This is a snowshoe hare, which operates in some really high temperatures and is using its, its uh, it, those big flappy ears for the opposite of, 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 of conserving heat here. It's trying to lose heat to the outside world. And so it can use these essentially like the radiators of a car to keep itself 
cool during the, uh, during the summertime. But so your thermal, we we'll call that thermoregulation. Thermoregulation just covers this way in which we regulate heat and how it moves around in our body, that critical, that critical heat. And so uh, for your hands, in this case, your fingers, one of the reasons your fingers get cold quickly when you go outside is your body is making them cold. Your body is constricting capillary flow. That cold chilling effect on your fingers actually causes your body not to pump extra blood to your fingers, but to do the opposite, to constrict capillaries, to allow your fingers to chill down because it's trying to conserve heat in your core. Uh, but there's a curious thing that happens. Uh, if you, uh, and this is called, it's been named the Hunter response and, and scientists have known about this for a long time. It was kind of a puzzle, but uh, so the, this, the, the tissue temperature drops, but your body then dilates the, the arteries and vessels in your, in your extremities and then constricts them again and then dilates them again, constricts them again. And so periodically it's sending pulses of heat into your limbs, I mean, evidently uh, to, to allow them to stay functional in this cold environment. Uh, this hunter response is notably, it's in people uh, is where it's been noted uh, first, although it's present in other animals too. Uh, the Inuit people of the far north have a, a greater hunter response than you or I would, so it obviously seems to be a, an adaptation to extreme cold. Uh, and, uh, and so I had to try to do the experiment on myself. And so I went in the backyard, had my, uh, my um, red thermometer with me. It was about two degrees outside at the time. And so I was just walking around the backyard without gloves on uh, for about 25 minutes, just keeping my hands moving. Uh, and uh, you can see the temperature, my, just for, if I'm indoors, about 70 degree temperature indoors. If you take the temperature on the back of your hand, mine is about 90 to 91 degrees. You can see even by the time I got outdoors, and just a few moments later, it dropped to 80 degrees. And then it drops relatively quickly uh, until you get uh, down here around in the mid 50s. And it sort of plateaus out for a while. Uh, and it's staying around 55 degrees out to about 25 minutes. It goes, I don't know what this is the hunter response here. I got bored at about this point. Uh, after I looked at the numbers later, I wished I waited a few more minutes, but, but this could be the hunter response kicking in or it could be just a, a blip on the, on, the, on the thermometer. But uh, interestingly, this is all the discomfort was here. When the skin temperature was dropping rapidly is where you where my fingers feel cold, and then at about this point, it really stops. It stops hurting. And Jackie doesn't believe this. A lot of people don't believe it because they never tried it. But uh, uh, actually, your 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 body will uh, readjust and maintain a sort of. I mean, obviously, I'm not telling you to go outside and get frostbite. This is just an interesting phenomena because our bodies are animal bodies, and so they evolved. To, to deal with it with a, sometimes a very cold world and yet a world in which we had to move around and to do things. And you didn't have things like gloves, you know, 200,000 years ago. So you had to, your, your body had to make up, uh, um, had to find a way around that. Uh, and animals uh, and warm blooded animals do a lot of interesting things. So we're gonna talk first about endotherms, which are animals that generate their own heat. So we have, and amongst those are actually two different classes. There are homeotherms like us, and we not only make our own heat, but our core body temperature stays the same uh, over a 24-hour hour cycle and throughout the year. Um, whereas there are heterotherms or endotherms that actually their body temperature changes, sometimes on a daily cycle or a yearly cycle. Um, Ruby-throated hummingbirds can actually go into what's called torpor, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute overnight is a way of conserving energy. Uh, they, they have to be super active during the day, but at night they're not active. And so if they can conserve energy, that's that much less energy they have to find the next day. Uh, groundhogs famously hibernate over, over winter and their body temperatures can drop uh, 60 degrees um, just to conserve energy. So which means that a given amount of fat storage 
gives you a, gives you a bigger safety margin if you can lower your body temperature. So that the idea that warm-blooded animals are better than cold-blooded animals is 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 is, is, uh, is more than a stretch. It's, it's an oversimplification. Uh, warm-bloodedness uh, endothermy comes at a great cost. Generating your own heat means you have to eat a lot. Um, which means you have to move around a lot. You mean you have to find a lot of things to eat, which means you're more vulnerable to predators. So there are both costs and benefits to making your own heat. Ectothermy, on the other hand, is just using the heat in the environment, which, uh, which you might say is the original environmentalists here, um, not, not uh, burning up a lot of energy, but rather using the little bit of heat in the environment um, to regulate our movement. So a snake is most active, whoops, uh, is most active uh, at temperatures between about 65 and 85. Below that, or you know, when you get down to that lower margin, snakes are often out on the trails in Glacial Park and in other places are unfortunately for the snakes out on the road, sunning themselves in the morning to, to raise their body temperature up and up into working temperature so they can go out and hunt and feed. Uh, and likewise, in really hot days in summer, you don't see them because they're in cover and in shade to kind of keep themselves cool. Um, but they have to eat much less than we do for their given body bulk because they're but they're not using a lot of energy to uh, to generate body heat. So they can eat a eat a vol and uh, and live on that one vol for much longer than you or I would be able to live on the energy, even even given the difference in body size on that vol. And likewise, insects. Being uh, um, ectotherms, not generating their own body heat, are, are really using a lot of the same strategies that other animals, and in fact, plants are using. They're, they're, they're controlling the freezing of water. They're moving it around in their tissues. Uh, they're either you know, controlling where ice crystals form in the tissues because most of these insects are not gonna be able to avoid Freezing, they may be able only to control the rate at which freezing, if you bury yourself in the leaf litter, then you're going to freeze more slowly. And that may be important to how ice crystals form in the tissue and then melt out later on. They can go into a hibernative sort of state called diapause. A very few of them can migrate famously like the, uh, the, the monarch butterfly. And some of them escape, escape damage much like, uh, much like plants do by, by spending their winter in a seed form. In other words, is eggs that are kind of simpler physiologically and able to tolerate freezing over winter or, or in a nymph form as an aquatic insect down below, but below the, down in liquid water so they can avoid freezing in that way. So insects, I mean, all life is responding to that world. All life is dependent on water, but all life in a sense becomes afraid of water during the, uh, during the winter time. But there are, and there are actually ectotherms, what we think of as cold-blooded animals that can maintain a fairly constant body temperature if they live in an environment that's at a fairly constant temperature. So, so animals that live in deep water, uh, deep ocean water, some of those really weird fearsome looking fish in deep ocean areas are actually homeotherms, but ectothermic, they can generate their own energy, they just live in a situation where the environmental temperatures remain constant. Hey Tom, well, I had a question. Okay. Do you when, know what change happens in our bodies over winter months that makes 35 degrees feel balmy in the spring versus unbearable <laughs> in the fall? Oh, that's a good question. I, I, don't, I don't know that one. That's a, that's a sort of the way you're the way you're sensing it. I mean, is, is that a difference in the tissues, the actual tissues of my body, or is it just a psychological thing? I don't know that, but that's a good question. That's, a, that's one I'm gonna to try to look up later on because that's an obvious one. We all, we all feel that every year that, you know, 30 degrees is just so bone chilling cold and in, uh, in late October or November, but by January, you know, you're taking off your jacket and walking around in the sun when it's 30 degrees because it feels warm. Yeah, that's a remarkable thing, but I don't, I don't know the answer to that one. So torpor, torpor is, a, is a state much like hibernation, only temporarily slowing down your body, cooling it off in order to, to save metabolic 
energy. And again, the more energy you save, the less you have to eat. And, and surviving through a winter when food items are scarce, it's critically important not only to, 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 to avoid cooling off, but when you, it's, it's to avoid that energy expenditure so you don't have to replace it with as much food tissue. Shrews are uh, famously frenetic, uh, active animals uh, and have to eat sometimes several times their body weight during a day, uh, need, to, need to conserve energy whenever possible and they do that by, by using torpor. Several bird species that were fairly common in our region, morning doves, uh, whippoorwill, this is, the, this is the poor will from the west, which is famously goes in a very deep torpor. Um, but whippoorwills, uh, chimney swifts, uh, and chickadees too. I mean, the chickadee is the only one I know that, that completely overwinters. Doves will hang around late into the winter. So you see a few of them through much of the winter. Um, and chimney swifts are migratory, but, but chimney swifts are active all day long. And as, as particularly as temperatures are getting colder, they're saving heat energy during the day when they, when they, uh, when they roost or, or get on their nest, they're, they're going into a torpor, their body temperature drops, they're conserving energy. Again, always for the same reason, conserving energy so you don't have to gather as much during the day. And bats, uh, it's the brown bat, so migratory. So we'll talk about migration very briefly here in a minute, but that's an obvious way you avoid the, the problems of winter, but just the problems of, of, of cold, at least cold relative to, to the heat of the body. I mean, conserving energy is big up with using torpor this time during the, during the daytime when the bat is not active uh, and then warming up and being active during, during the night. Even you, even your body changes temperature during the day. Uh, um, where, where our body typically cools off during the night. I mean, it's, you wouldn't really call it torpor. It's only a couple of degrees, but it's the same. It's, it's, it's a biological, it's a fact of, or an ecological fact, the need to save energy. I mean, we can always run to McDonald's and get another Big Mac if we need more energy, but you know, human beings 300,000 years ago, it was a limited food budget, particularly, particularly in winter. Uh, and so they need to save energy and, uh, and saving energy by, by reducing body temperature slightly at night, it makes a difference. And then rising during the day when you need to be active and foraging for food, uh, it's critically important. I think, Tom, we got another question. Okay. Are there genetic differences that account for how a human body can adapt to temperatures? You mentioned how the Inuits have different body adaptations. People well, originally from warmer climates seem to be able to tolerate heat more than those who come from colder climates. Well, that's just another good question. I know that there are, there are, there are, it's been documented that Inuit have that hunter response more strongly than, uh, than do uh, people as I've habitually stayed at more temperate latitudes. Uh, beyond that, I, I don't know. I mean, I would be, I, we, it would kind of make sense that prolonged over many, many generations staying in any one of these places would cause some of these physiological changes or, or sort of ge genetic influence in these physiological adaptations to change, but I don't, I don't know that for a fact. I'd have to look that one up. So this is a, I mean, this is an obvious way. Not many mammals do migration, but birds, a lot of birds do migration. Caribou migrate. There are some elk migrate in the, in the Rockies, really elevational migrations. Uh, so that migration is really about increasing food availability and reducing energy expenditure. Um, just moving into areas where you find more food and lose less heat to the environment. That's a, that's a common sense thing as long as you learn about those energy budgets for all organisms during the winter. But there are costs that come with migration as you're moving, particularly for birds, moving over very long distances. It's a huge energy cost of migration. I mean, they're, they're this, you know, flying many, many miles, um, uh, sometimes from, uh, you know, from our latitudes all the way into South America. That's an almost unimaginable expenditure of energy for something like a chimney swift. And a lot of them don't make it. Uh, there's a predation risk as you're moving through areas that are at least less familiar in terms of predator risk. 
than it would be if you just stayed in the same nesting and breeding territory year round. And you have barrier cross costs. I mean, like crossing the Gulf of Mexico, a lot of birds just don't make it. They just drop into the drink and, and they're gone. So this is, I mean, migration is like a perfect strategy, but it comes with some pretty extreme costs. And so not all birds do it. Some of them have evolved ways of staying close by, or some are just short distance migrants um, that are just moving far enough south, like uh, often geese are, or geese are nowadays, or urban geese just move far enough south to find a little bit of open water and then come right back north again when the water opens up. So you have short distance migrants, doves, really don't, I mean, often they're relatively short distance migrants that then move back north again as soon as it starts to warm up. So uh, migration, another strategy. Hibernation, another one that animals use. And again, if, if, if food is hard to come by from the winter, you want to reduce, you want to reduce the amount of food you eat. Torpor is one of those ways, just slowing down and cooling off during the night uh, is a way of using less energy, therefore needing less energy. But in a more extreme case, you just simply go dormant for the entire winter season. So like a fox snake, pretty common uh, example of, of an animal that goes into a, a, um, hibernation in a hibernacula below ground. Uh, often animal burrows are sometimes foundations of old buildings uh, become hibernacula for lots of fox snakes and other snakes. And the advantages are obviously that you're losing less energy, but, but being still all winter comes up with disadvantages like predators. I mean, groundhogs, not all groundhogs night sleep peacefully in their burrow all winter. Some of them are eaten by badgers. This is how badgers make a living is they're burrowing around eating groundhogs and, and uh, chipmunks during the winter and you're not able to move out of the way because you're, you're dormant. Uh, you can't replenish uh, winter food supplies during the winter. So however much fat supplies you're able to, uh, to build up during the fall is what you've got to make it through the winter. You're not able to go out and replenish those food supplies. So it's if pickings are slim in the fall and it's particularly cold winter, it might not be enough to get you through. And you're, all, you're vulnerable to extreme environmental fluctuations like with the Massasauga, which hibernates uh, Below, below water in the shallow muds, uh, deep floods, I guess, can kill it. Obviously, it just it cuts off at least some of that oxygen supply. Um, um, and so it's vulnerable to extreme environmental fluctuations. If you're a fox snake below ground, you may be far enough bo below ground 10 winters in a row to get through just fine. But if on that 11th winter, we have a prolonged period where the temperatures are getting, you know, 10 and 20 below. Uh, that hibernacula may not protect you and you may freeze to death. So, uh, but um, animals are using a lot of those same strategies, sugars and sugar alcohols to control freezing in their tissues. Uh, um, yeah, animals and plants uh, exploit a lot of this at the, at the chemical and, and cellular level are exploiting many of the same phenomena. We have frogs that avoid freezing by, uh, by living below water, but above the mud. So in, where water is still in the liquid state, I mean, they can protect themselves from some freezing. If the freezing is not deep freezing, they can, they can uh, increase sugar and sugar alcohol contents uh, in their uh, and there are tissues that uh, prevent uh, freezing of the tissues. Uh, but there are some frogs that just allow themselves to freeze solid into frog sickles. So, uh, and those are using strategy, again, very much like plants. They're, um, they're, they're seeding ice nuclei to control where, tish, where ice crystals are forming. So in spaces between organs where it's not gonna puncture or disrupt the organs. Uh, and it can uh, increase, you know, antifreeze, it can increase sugar and, and uh, other things in the cells to prevent ice formation. In this case, the blood flow can actually freeze solid and stop and it can just wake up in the springtime. Not many animals can do that. Don't try it yourself at home. That one, that one doesn't work for us. Other winter behaviors. I mean, some of these are, are pretty common. You see birds 
that look twice their size sitting there on a winter twig in the winter, particularly in the morning, if they've been, if you're seeing them as they're still coming off the roost, uh, they're, they're fluffed up. They actually have little muscles at the tip of every feather shaft that allow them to pull the feather up to increase the insulation value. Just as in a hair, in a mammals, we have a little called an erector pill muscle at the base of each hair that pulls that hair up. Uh, and well, that's the, the you know, the, the, uh, hair standing up on little goose goosebumps. Uh, that's the erector pill muscle. It doesn't really serve much of a function with people. But with other mammals, it increases that insulating value. Whenever animals group together in herds or flocks, I mean, some birds will, will, will uh, roost together in groups. Whenever you get two warm objects next to one another, some of the heat lost by one is warming up the one next to it. So moving in herds and, oh, I actually have some pictures here. That's a, that's a fat little robin. I mean, caribou moving together, uh, all of these are ways of conserving energy. I mean, they may not immediately be obvious, but just the proximity of warm animals. Penguins famously, uh, they're not, I mean, they may be talking to one another too, but they're, uh, they're using that grouping behavior. Nesting, you know, cover, cover of all kinds. Uh, uh, birds uh, often go into evergreens, dense evergreens. The evergreen foliage capturing some of the heat, re-radiating it, re it back to the bird so the bird is able to warm up the airspace around itself. And then caching food supply. All my, all my work over the, over the years with oak reproduction, I became acutely aware of where and when and how animals are caching food. Squirrels among the more um, famous food cacher, caching acorns in the ground and then retrieving them uh, at least in the early fall and then into the next spring and well well through the entire next growing season, they'll be retrieving those acorns as food. And then other ways that animals protect themselves. This is the Bergman's, this is the shapes and sizes. Now this is sort of physics again, but we're, we're now we live in a world where, where animals are just spheres. And we wanna know which ones, which one of these animals, the little sphere or the big sphere, can keep itself warm. If this is a warm-blooded animal, which can keep itself warm better? And, uh, and to do that, we have to think about how much living tissue is inside of each one of them generating heat and, how, and what is the ratio to the surface area on which, across which the heat radiates to the outside world or is conducted into the air around it on the outside world. And in this case, it's the big animal that keeps itself warm much more easily. Uh, because it has, if you, if you make something, in this case, four times as big, it has eight times the surface area. So, so you'd think, well, in a linear dimension, it's now twice as big. So it has four times the surface area, but it has, uh, or excuse me, 16 size. So it's four times the length, it's 16 times the surface area, and it's 64 times the volume or the weight. And so that's the mass of living tissue. That's the amount of heat energy. So it's relationship of heat energy generated to surface area is much more favorable for winter conditions than is the small an animal. Uh, and so you can, Bergman pointed out that at least with certain animal groups as they go northward, they get bigger like bears. Uh, Allen's rule is about the shape of animals. Uh, and that is that here we have two animals that for the sake of discussion, we'll say have the same mass, but they're very different shapes. One of them is a sphere and one of this is a elongate, sort of ellipsoid. Uh, which one of these keeps itself warm better? And the answer is the sphere because its ratio of surface area to mass is much more conservative. It loses heat much more slowly than a long skinny animal. So maybe you've never wondered why there are no mammalian snakes. A snake is a very efficient way of moving around into the burrows of other animals and climbing trees. It's a fascinating creature. Why, don't, why didn't mammals evolve snake-like forms? And the answer is a long skinny mammal would lose energy to the environment so rapidly it couldn't eat enough to stay alive. And now, we wanna, now we're gonna have the real star of the show. Jackie's gonna talk a little bit about animal tracks in winter. We had on that one day I mentioned when I was putting out the sensor, we hoped to find some animal tracks. It ended up being a bonanza day for animal tracks. When I went back to pick up the sensors three days later, there was nothing. The wind had blown and it was all erased, but you get a real treat here. <laughs> 
So take it over, Jackie. Thank you. And I wouldn't call myself the star of the show, seeing so that's called Tom Talks, but thank you for the uh, introduction. And I'm going to switch over to sharing my screen. But if you guys have a question, now would be a good time to take a couple of questions. Um, if you can unmute yourself and ask, that would be a little easier because I will not be able to see the chat as I'm switching over. Hey, this is Matt Evans. I have a question. Okay. Hey, Tom, thanks so much. So a lot of the sedges and some other graminoids and a few forbs stay green over the winter. Yeah. I was wondering if you could just talk about that a little bit. Well, you know, it's not, the, the secret to keeping a plant part alive in the winter is the same for a flowering plant like a sedge it is for a spruce tree. It's a matter of where you put the water, um, the, the solutes, the sugars and sugar alcohols in the water, uh, about moving moving the water out of vacuoles and the cytoplasm and there from an air cell, so that whole story is pretty much the same for both kinds of plants. And so it's not that broadleaf plants, like it's impossible to be evergreen. So there are, it's just that it doesn't, it's made sense in the evolution of broadleaf plants. That, they're, that they just drop their leaves and, and undergo the metabolic cost of creating more in the next year or so. You know, a plant like white avens will keep those dark, beautiful, dark green, almost bluish green leaves right at the base. And so it can photosynthesize almost right away in the springtime when, when the temperature or when, the, when, the, when you get that spring thaw, likewise with some of the sedges you're pointing out, that green tissue can much more rapidly start to photosynthesize and feed the root system. And it, you know, the, the metabolic cost is the cost of, of all that antifreeze and protection, the whole, the whole idea of hardening off the tissue. So it's a, I mean, it's, 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 we think of evergreens, you know, conifers is the only plants that can survive in winter, but other plants can do it. It's just that most of them, the metabolic trade-offs in evolution, they just decided not to, and they just trade off dropping the leaves off. Oh, Thank let's you. Let's take one more question and then we'll go on to the next part. Unless there's radio silence, I can go on. Okay, <laughs> silence is deadly, so. All right. So, um, are you seeing the screen all right? You're seeing just the presentation? Everything look good? Say yes. Yeah, good. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, in presentation mode, I can't necessarily make sure everything is working correctly, so I appreciate that. Um, winter is a really great time to look for animal tracks. Uh, this is one of my favorite activities. Um, so the conditions that you want to go out looking for tracks for in are when there's a fresh snow. You don't necessarily want it to be too cold or too deep um, because that fluffy snow caves in but you can still find some pretty good spots, um, especially in the woods where the snow is a little bit lower. Um, maybe if the temperature heats up a little bit when it's that um, nice texture to keep the tracks. Um, you can also check out some spots that are near to open water uh, as a lot of animals will frequent that area. And then because their paws are wet, they're leaving nice clear tracks that freeze. So you can find a lot of neat things there. The guidebooks will have you believe that you're going to find these perfect tracks with every little toe visible. And in reality, you're kind of just looking at holes in the snow and kind of guesstimating based on size, uh, what they're doing, and trying to figure out what that could be. Um, as a heads up, as it gets warmer, tracks, especially if they were frozen in ice, can melt and become bigger. I actually had a funny scenario. Um, I was taking a class where we were tracking predators in northern Minnesota, so it was totally feasible that a cougar could have passed in the area. And we identified this track and went to our teacher and said, I think we found a cougar. This is so cool. If you find something that you think is uncommon or rare or super cool, just pause for a second and go back and see if it could possibly be anything else that's much more common, because that's most likely the case. What we were actually looking at was a bobcat track that had melted and expanded so much that it was the size of a cougar track. So some of the things that you're going to want to look for 
as the pattern of how they're walking, um, which is called the gait. So a human walks in what we call diagonal pattern. So this would be similar for dogs, cats, hoofed animals, and the other patterns you would see, um, think about how the animal moves. So a pacer would be something like a skunk where the right side of the body is moving at the same time and then it moves the whole left side of the body at the same time. So they have this lumbering walk with the, the steps really close together. And oftentimes, especially if you have deep snow or like right now, it just kind of looks like a tunnel that's the width of their body and you don't really see much of the detail of the tracks. Um, another common one that you'll see are bounders. So think about this uh, weasel jumping when it lands, front paws are first, and then the back paws land, and then it jumps off. Often what you see is only those two back feet. So like it's a pattern of two, and then two, and then two. And we also have gallopers. So think of rabbits or squirrels where their back feet are landing first and those front feet are going to be much smaller. Um, and you could tell the direction they're moving because the big back feet will be in the front. So this example, you're going from the bottom to the top of the tracks. You're going to want to know how to understand some of the terminology in your guidebook to help you out. So stride is the distance to do one pace. So if you look from the front of the left foot to the front of the next left foot, that is one stride. Straddle is the width. So think the farthest left to the farthest right of the track is going to give you that distance. And then beyond that, look for patterns that you think you would see with the behavior of the animal. Um, for example, a lot of people wonder if they're seeing a domestic dog or a coyote or a fox. Um, anyone who has a dog can tell you they are swerving all over the place, snipping things. It's almost like they just can't pay attention. They see something, they run off. So a wild dog will not do that necessarily. Um, they may wander from side to side sometimes, but for the most part, you're going to see them going in a straight line from point A to point B to conserve their energy. Um, another pattern that you'll see is um, called indirect registry, which uh, is when the dog steps, its back paw doesn't necessarily land right on top of where the front paw landed Ber versus a wild dog like a fox or coyote. It lands directly on that paw print. So it looks like you almost have a person who just happens to have paws walking left to right, left to right. It looks like only one set of tracks. Um, you can also see with dog tracks, um, their paws are a little bit more splayed out. It's like they're spread out. They're trying to get traction and they're, it's like a circular shape to the paw print if you look at it as a whole versus a wild dog will be more of an oval shape. Um, it's much more streamlined. Um, generally, the straddle is much uh, smaller for a wild dog as well. And that's because their body is meant to be more streamlined. Um, and I highly recommend getting yourself some kind of book. There are many out there that show tracks, uh, ideally with a ruler on the back so that you can measure the distances while you're in the field with it. So I'm gonna play a couple of videos. Feel free to unmute yourself and say what you think you see. Anybody notice any patterns? Okay. Can you play it one more time? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I gave you clues already. <laughs> So do we notice any patterns? Like how they're moving. This person or this it's animal seems straight. to be a bounder. I was gonna say it was straightforward. It's not the diagonal. So yeah, it's gonna be the bounder. Mm -hmm. So we see two and then two and then two. There's also this little line in between the tracks. 
Uh, and we attribute that to the tail dragging. So it's something that has a longer tail. Um, it's hard to see the size reference. What you really should do if you take a picture is put a ruler or maybe your hand or a glove next to the tracks so that when you're looking it up later, you have a pretty solid size reference. And this happened to be an open prairie habitat. So when I pull out my handy dandy guidebook, this tells me it's probably some type of mouse. And deer mice are really common. And you can see the tracks kind of match what we're looking at here. Oh. Um, they're in most habitats, uh, but there are many mice that have near identical tracks. So um, we looked at the other possibilities that could be here. Um, a meadow jumping mouse was one of the ones that showed up in the book, but it says it has a long deep hibernation period. So it's pretty unlikely that it would be that. And um, as far as the uh, white footed mouse, uh, it was kind of the wrong habitat. Those would tend to be more in a wooded area. So we'll have another guess here. You see any similarities to the last one? The tail? Yeah, we've got a tail. about our pattern? So we're looking at pretty much almost the same tracks, except that we're in a woodland habitat this time, which tells me it's probably the white-footed mouse. And here's one with two sets of tracks. So what I thought was interesting, as we were hiking, there were a few things that we had called a mouse, but we didn't bring a ruler with initially. And then we finally saw mouse tracks next to it like this. And the tracks we were looking at were much bigger so it almost has the same pattern if you don't have a size reference to have that tail drag. It's a bounder. There's two and then two and then two. So what that tells me is, first of all, we're looking at two different species. But since it's quite a bit bigger, it looks like we're looking at a long-tailed weasel, which are pretty common in our area too. Um, and you can even compare. They've got the length and width of the prints. Um, if you get a really clear day, it's kind of cool to see the shape of their paw print is actually quite different. Um, but that depends on really good snow conditions. Usually you just get two circular-ish holes in the snow. So tracks are a great way to tell a story. So let's follow our long-tailed weasel here and see what happens. Any guesses on what happened here? <laughs> got him. <laughs> I think he got him. Yeah. Something came in from above. Some kind of raptor, but who? <laughs> so I gave you a clue. It, I'll put a disclaimer here and just say it could be a different kind of raptor, a red-tailed hawk or something else. Um, but I liked the description in this book. Um, uh, the owl is not the most graceful of walkers. And so you usually see a big messy imprint. Um, if you have really good snow conditions, you might be able to see how clear the edges of the wing prints are. Owls have fringed wings, so it would be more of a fuzzy edge to the wings versus hawks or other species that don't need to be silent flyers would have a very clear edge to their wing print. Are these characteristics starting to jump out at you anymore? Mm -hmm. I'll show you this. There we go. 
So yeah, we're seeing kind of similar to before where there's two little prints that's bounding tracks. They seem to be much closer together than the other one. Um, so it has a shorter stride and it leads to this tunnel over here, which Tom gave you a clue earlier as to what that could be. So it's a, a similar size as a mouse. There's no tail drag, so it probably has a short tail. Um, and it tunnels under the snow, which tells me that it is a meadow vole. Um, and Tom talked about how those guys stay pretty close to the ground. Uh, neat thing, since we had this slide about owls, is they can actually hear to about a foot under the snow. So sometimes you'll see vole trails, um, and just the little tunnels going along. And then suddenly there's a big wing print strike mark where an owl got it. So this one looks pretty different. Are there any guesses as to what this could be? Hmm. Well, this one's much more erratic than the last one. We do have these interesting lines here looks kind of like wings. Yes. And there are little feet being dragged every so often. So this is also pretty small if you had the size reference. So we're guessing this is some kind of uh, songbird that is searching around for food. Common one we have around here is the dark-eyed junco. But this is a really great example of the book shows you something that seems like it should be very clear. And then when you get into real life, it does not look like that. Um, so keep in mind your habitat and what time of year it is. Um, if you're not sure if the species you're identifying is correct, make sure to check if it's in your range and if it's the time of year when they would be around because many of our bird species do migrate. Um, and for that, you can go to eBird. Um, this chart isn't actually for that species, but uh, they have a spot where you can look at the species, enter your region. If you type in Illinois, you can see the frequency at which that bird is in your area at that time of year. Let's look at another bird print here. I just love following the stories. So this one seems like he was hopping around and then had a takeoff. So two little wing flaps here, but they're really clear. This one is a very common species, if anyone wants to take a guess. Anybody? All right. Is it Tom? Is it Tom? No. He would have to have really little feet. Um, so what we're looking at here is something that has a diagonal walk. So you're right in guessing that it's something with a diagonal walk like a human would have. Um, it's kind of misleading because it, there's these drags in between the feet. So it looks like somebody was too lazy to pick up their feet. And that's not entirely untrue with this species. You tend to see really deep tracks um, because their feet are not particularly adapted to stay on top of the snow. They just punch right through with their small pointy feet. Is it a deer? Yes. White-tailed deer. And if you're very lucky, you have the right type of snow, you can sometimes see their dew claws. Deer leave other signs as well. Um, this video shows you deer walking up and, uh, where they had a, a buck rub on the tree. They also leave scat, the fancy word for poop, and it'll make more sense on the next slide in comparison, but uh, their poop is a really dark, like blackish color um, compared to some other things you could find. 
They also bed down in the snow so you can see these little impressions that would fit a nicely curled up deer body in the snow. Often as they're leaving, they will pee or poop in the deer bed. Um, and you can find evidence of deer brows by looking at the plants around you. If they look like the edge has sort of been shredded off, that's likely a deer. Another really common species, if anybody wants to take a guess. It looks like the pattern of a rabbit, is it? Yes, very good. Um, so you're looking for the hind foot is much bigger. Um, this is the direction it's going from left to right for that particular track. Um, the four feet for rabbits and squirrels can look similar, but rabbits will have uh, one foot and then the other versus squirrels will have the two four feet right next to each other. And uh, we got lucky with those particular tracks that you could actually see the individual toes. Um, other things that look similar would be like a snowshoe here, but we're really not gonna see those this far south. And those tracks are significantly larger. Rabbits, you can also find their presence by browsing the uh, plants. A rabbit with their rodent-like teeth takes a really clean cut off of those plants versus that deer has that nice shred that you can really tell the difference between the two. And in comparison to deer scat, um, rabbits have almost a sawdust color. It's a little bit bigger in their scat. Um, so if you're trying to tell the difference between who was there, um, that's a good clue. So that is all I have for the tracks. Anybody have questions? That was cool. Awesome. Um, I had someone ask, what is this book called? And so I have the Animal Tracks of the Great Lakes by Ian Sheldon. Okay. There are other books out there. Um, I like to, whenever I visit anywhere with a a nature center or like a national park, I will see if they have any books for sale. And usually there's a nice local option. Um, so I bought this one in Minnesota, but there are plenty of other ones out there. Thank you. Welcome. All right, Tom, do you have other slides or is it time for questions? No, I think it's time for questions now. I, I'm, yeah, I could, I don't wanna just ram ramble on, I'd rather, Hear, hear people's questions. I mean, I can't answer any question. I'm sure Jackie can either. But it's, it's, you can't certainly can't answer them if you don't ask them. So, mm -hmm. fine. So yes, yeah, so you have the option to unmute and ask your question or type it in the chat. Um, I see a couple of questions in the chat, um, so I'll read those aloud. Um, has anyone read Winter World by Heinrich? Uh, Dave, if you want to add any. Thing about that book, feel free to unmute yourself. All right, well, we'll take that book recommendation. Um, what does a skunk track look like? Um, I will see if I can pull up a picture in a second, but um, let's see. If anybody has a question that they would like to uh, ask out loud. That's all the questions that are in the chat so far, and I will pull up the skunk track picture. Okay. One of the things that, one of the questions I got an email before the presentation were about not seeing a lot of skunks and raccoons uh, during the hardest part of winter. Well, well neither one of those uh, hibernate. They do uh, during particularly difficult times during the winter, they will more or less cease activity for a while. Uh, so you don't see them because they're not moving around and they'll wait until conditions moderate somewhat. And you know, that's, that's the same, we're, we're always talking about the same thing about animals surviving winter. You have the cost of going out and looking for food versus the benefit of finding the food. And uh, if the conditions are really terrible, then going out uh, means the cost is too high for the benefit. So you just stay, stay under cover. Well, there's your striped skunk track. Um, if you get a, a book like we have, there's uh, 
and usually a nice section at the end that gives you sort of the highlights of what the overall pattern looks like um, and what it would look like if they were walking and then the page reference to more details. Um, question in the chat, what would you expect to be differences about the following growing seasons between mild and harsh winters? What are some examples? You say that over again? Um, what differences would you expect between a mild and a harsh winter during the growing season? Oh, I see on, on, the, on the sort of the carryover effect. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I, yeah. I mean, mostly, you know, the harsh, particularly uh, late, you know, late, late uh, thawing and warm up in the spring. I mean, with our phenology, it's pretty obvious that most, you know, most animals and plants are are uh, starting uh, their activity based on on the increase in temperatures. So when the growing season starts, is really not based on the calendar, but on the warming, you know, on the other hand, off many animals and plants anyway, their, their signal to go into dormancy in the fall is often related to day length. Uh, but anyway, uh, so I don't, I don't know if there's any, unless, unless a, a plant suffered a lot of winter damage, I mean, certainly you see, particularly in a domestic landscape where people have planted plants, you know, pretty far north of the native range or in areas where they're only marginally suitable, they'll suffer a lot of winter dieback. Um, and so there are some plants uh, that suffer winter dieback, which means that obviously affects their growth or at least their, their mature size the next year. But uh, I mean, most of our native plants and animals are pretty, pretty, pretty well hunkered down over winter and, they, and they're, ready, they're, they're ready to go. When, if they make it through the spring, they're ready, ready to go with, with the plants. So, uh, other than the timing of development, which is is uh, delayed, uh, I don't, I can't. If anyone else can think of some, I'm happy to happy to listen. But I, it seems to me the, the major effect would be the delay in the timing of, you know, breaking dormancy and growth. And another question in the chat: Are there studies on the winter mortality rates of different species? Well, certainly that's a time of, of you know major. Uh, high mortality on all. Uh, this is the, one of the costs of being a warm-blooded animal. I said it's a big advantage, but it, it's also a disadvantage. And uh, it's the time if deer are going to starve to death, they're going to starve to death in the winter, um, particularly if there are too many deer and not enough, and not enough uh, you know, um, shrubbery uh, because there's no green plants to eat on the ground or essentially none, particularly if it's ice covered. They're eating twigs and twigs uh, are, I mean, plants pull back a lot of nutrients from leaves into the twigs. So twigs are fairly nutritious. I mean, not for you and I, but they're pretty nutritious for browsing animals. But if you get too many deer, really up north where they'll yard up large, large numbers of deer coming together, again, to conserve heat, but they exhaust their food supplies and so you get a lot of die off over winter. I mean, I'm sure there have been lots of studies to pick a species if it's an important species, particularly game animal, and people have done studies on the mortality over winter, but I, I can't think of anything. I, I haven't, it's not my field of expertise, so I'm not sure I can um, go much farther than that. Do really snowy winters have any notable impacts on the following growing season? It is, I would assume growing season would refer m more or less to, to plants, but um, certainly a lot of snow, you know, late snow melt delays things. I mean, it's probably more, I mean, when I, in the phenology program, we monitored air temperature, probably it's soil temperatures in the springtime because the, the perinating organs, the bulbs of, of uh, these spring ephemeral plants and, and rhizomes are sitting in the soil, there aren't really not any plant parts out there to, to, uh, to send the temperature. They're responding to soil temperatures, and while snow, snow moderates soil temperatures during winter, they don't go down 
as low. They also don't warm up as fast in the springtime because, because of the insulating effect of the snow that will keep that soil temperature at the surface at 30, 32 degrees until it's exposed to sunlight. So that both the, the effect of, of deep snow, again, will be to delay early, uh, early uh, leaf. I mean, one of the things I'd like to know is, is that explanation shouldn't work for trees when their leaves come out. So that'll be an interesting thing to find out with the phenology program, whether we can see uh, a difference between the way trees are responding in their bud burst in the spring in a way in the way spring ephemeral plants are responding that are growing out of the ground, which in some cases is covered in snow. So that's a question I can't completely answer, but a few more years of the phenology program, we might be able to at least estimate an answer. You're gonna like this next question. Uh, if you had to winter through Illinois for a season as any animal but human, what would you want to be and why? <laughs> You know, I've spent so much time with squirrels over the last, just because of the oak reproduction work. I maybe I've absorbed some uh, squirreliness. I don't know. Um, you think I'd want to be something a bit more majestic than a squirrel? Um, but I'll, I'll just pick a, a fox squirrel because I see less of those. Yeah, that's that's my animal. They're they're gonna, you know, they're gonna overwinter. Squirrels spend. We, we see those leaf nests. Squirrels are gonna spend a lot of time. A lot of their stored food in the winter is stored in hollows in trees. And you can tell that because the squirrels are alive and active through the winter and yet you don't see any evidence of them digging down to the soil to, to get those winter food supplies. So they, they're both storing acorns in the ground, but they also have other caches that are, that are available during the winter. So I'll, I'll pick being a fox squirrel. That'll be my choice. How about you, Jackie? What's your choice? Well, my first inkling would be to say a wolf because that's my favorite animal, but that's too obvious. So oh, I'd probably go with like a river otter because when you see their tracks, it just looks like they're having fun. There's like belly slides and they're making ramps up and down, falling into the river, splashing around. So probably a river otter. Okay. All right. Um, do white oak acorns germinate in the winter? Uh, white oak acorns germinate soon after falling to the ground, so they've already germinated in the in the fall. It's one of the, I mean, there are a few other oaks in the white oak group that germinate in the fall. Burr oaks, actually, few of them germinate in the fall. Most of those are dormant over winter and germinate in the spring, but that changes a bit as you go south. Burr oak populations further south have more fall germinating acorns. So it's a, I mean, in most of the red oaks that I know of, and I don't, I don't have personal experience with all the oak species, but most of those are dormant over winter. White oaks are, are locally the exception. And you can, uh, uh, a year with a heavy acorn crop, and if you just go in the woods and start looking around, you'll see the acorns there in the root radical poking out. Um, they're already trying to grow just within days or a week of falling to the ground. Great. It is after 12 if anybody has to go. As long as there are questions, we'll stay on. Um, so now is your chance. Not seeing anything. Are there, wait, there. real quick, are there any like special like adaptations that help animals get through like these horrible recent like temperatures that we had say last week? Like what, do they have to do anything different or just kind of hope for the best? I mean, my, I guess my answer is it's more of the same because they're, what they're going to do is, is if they have the option, they're going to hunker down. They're going to stay in cover, depends on the animal, but they're going to, they're going to stay uh, out, of, out of the extreme elements as much as they can unless starvation forces them out. So, uh, and uh, beyond that, it's, it's the, it's, it's the uh, you know, the, the, yeah, depending on the animal. Um, yeah, possums seem to be kind of an exception. They don't, they tend to, they, they are somewhat less active when it's really cold, but they don't uh, stay, they'll move around from place to place, even during the winter. I think it's because they're not very smart, but possums are very successful animals. So I, I don't like calling them 
smart and dumb. But uh, I would say it's really the same adaptations to the normal winter, only in more extreme form. And whenever the temperature drops really low, the, 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 uh, the imperative is to lose as little energy as possible. So they're going to try to seek out cover and stay there if they can. And they'll only leave if, if starvation is the, is the other option. Any other questions? Hey, Tom. Hi, Joe. Hi. Uh, in a poem by Shakespeare, uh, the woman, I think her name was Joan, living inside, and outside an owl is calling, to woo, to wit, which is normally a scary sound for human beings, except in the middle of winter, it is a merry sound for Joan. My point is, how does the owl feel? <laughs> <laughs> well, I would guess an should owl. Joan, should Joan go out and sing for the owl? <laughs> uh, well, I would, I would guess. Uh, not sure, quite sure how many. Uh, I've seen long owls visiting the UK. I don't. Uh, I'm sure there are other species of owls there. I don't know what sound a barn owl makes and whether that was the one Shakespeare was referring to. But I guess as most animals, if they're well fed, are, are pretty happy. So uh, the barn owl has lots of rats uh, and, uh, and mice to eat. It sees probably uh, smiling, regardless of whether Joan sings to him or not. <laughs> I have to imagine the owls would be pretty happy. Most of them are doing, uh, they start their courtship, shall we say, pretty early in the year. And uh, they may be flirting around this time. I, I, some, I, some, I mean, some owls could be very frustrated. I mean, yeah. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, there's another thing was going on in my mind while this is going on. It's probably because of computers and technology, but up in the corner, some news agency is sending me this little note about the uh, extravagant lifestyle of uh, Baron Trump. And I don't want to get political, but while you were talking, I was thinking about Richard III and the winter of discontent. <laughs> so anyway. Okay, well, yeah, that's a different sort of winter. Um, yeah, I know. Well, and any other questions? I want to thank everyone for coming. This has been, uh, it's been a lot of fun. I, I always underestimate how fun it's going to be to actually do the presentation. Uh, even though you're not bodily present, and I really miss the presence of people in a classroom. Uh, I've sort of adjusted to, to Zoom, and I can at least imagine your presence better. Now, the first, the first one of these Tom Talks, I was a little shaky because I felt like I was talking to a computer, but I can kind of imagine the people now better. So, yeah, it's a lot of fun. So I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Have a good day.